So, Mr. Kirby, can we uh, start the program then? I can just introduce the topic and you once again for some of our guests and uh, friends who must be uh, here for the first time. Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mittal, for having me for the second time uh, in the virtual law school in India. Uh, I I am going to speak for about 40 minutes and then we are going to have some Q&A. Is that the understanding? Yeah, perfect. So I'll just quickly introduce uh, you as our guest for the day and also the topic uh, for our audience and the students who are also going to view it online uh, on the live streaming that we're doing on the Facebook. Right. So with your permission for a minute, I can do that. Good. Go ahead. Right. So good morning, my dear friends in India, and good evening, my dear friends in Australia. So we are very honored to host Honorable Mr. Kirby once again uh, for a program on virtual law school uh, as part of the Global Legal Approaches and Development Talk. So uh, it's, it's our good fortune that uh, uh, Mr. Michael Kirby could give us another opportunity to interact, and our students are going to benefit immensely. And there's one of the very intriguing subject matters, interesting, intriguing, and which requires a lot of uh, attention from legal academia, lawyers, human rights lawyers, judges across the world, which is about equality discourse on LGBT rights. My dear friends, today's talk is all about understanding that what has been the transition of the LGBT rights and its entire philosophy and discourse on equality especially in India and also some of the Commonwealth countries. So in that regard, Mr. Michael Kirby is going to talk today about LGBT rights with a special reference to the cause of the decision making that took place in India, right from reading down of Section 377 of Indian Penal Code and involving, you know, the reasons and findings and the decisions of NAS Foundation, Foundation was seen in India then later, which was reversed in Kaushal versus Nas Foundation. And then we have the Navte Singh Johar versus Union of India judgment. So that's going to be a discussion. It's going to be, uh, you know, entire perspective on this particular aspect alongside that we will understand through the lecture from Mr. Kirby that what has been his experience in Australia and other jurisdictions on this similar issue. And to tell you, my dear friends, Mr. Kirby was a justice of High Court of Australia, the nation's highest court, uh, from 1996 to 2009. Previously, Mr. Kirby was also the president of Court of Appeal of South, uh, New South Wales in Australia and also of Solomon Islands. Between 1975 to 84, Mr. Kirby was inaugural chairman of Australian Law Reform Commission and has been giving several talks and lectures in a lot of law schools and universities in India. And we also were happy and you know, privileged to host uh, Mr. Kirby pre, uh, last time on October 4, uh, earlier this month. And uh, so we are here looking forward to a lecture which is going to uh, set the discourse and also about the thinking process for our law students, law researchers and scholars in India who have no doubt been doing commendable work on this particular subject matter but we will also add a lot of new dimensions. And that's my earnest request to all our student friends and also some of the law teachers who are joining in and some of them who might be uh, uh, listening to the lecture through Facebook Live, please send us questions or you can also participate directly for the purpose of your interaction with Mr. Kirby and we will be happy to facilitate. So on that note, Mr. Kirby, I welcome you once again and over to you for your lecture today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mittal. It's very nice to be back at the uh, virtual uh, university law school. And um, I'm especially glad to be taking part in this uh, lecture and dialogue about uh, the issue of sexuality, uh, sexual orientation, and gender identity, S-O-G-I. Uh, this is a new uh, frontier of human rights uh, and everything I'm going to say is said uh, even better than I'm going to say it 
uh, in a publication which uh, was made by Universal Law Publishing in New Delhi in India. Uh, this uh, is the published series of Tagore Law Lectures that I delivered in, uh, in uh, Kolkata in uh, 19, um, in 2013 when I had the honor to deliver the Tagore lectures on this subject. Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, a New Province of Law for India. So if you need more information, uh, this is a very handy, brief uh, and punchy, uh, interesting, uh, readable series uh, of chapters, uh, which were the lectures that I gave at the University of Calcutta. Um, my familiarity with the issue upon which my lectures were based goes back to my own childhood because one thing uh, which we all shared in common uh, if we were countries of the British Empire or the uh, Commonwealth of Nations was every one of us inherited uh, a criminal law uh, and that criminal law invariably contained uh, a legal provision uh, against crimes so-called against the order of nature. Uh, those crimes uh, were a common feature of the inheritance uh, of British rule. Uh, they were not always um, areas of the law that had preceded British rule. They were not always something upon which colonial peoples had originally felt very strongly. But from 1290, uh, in the reign of King Edward I in England, uh, largely under pressure from the churches, or the Universal Church and its, um, its officials, um, the uh, kings of England had uh, made laws against um, sexual uh, offences falling within the category of sexual orientation, gender identity. Uh, and uh, it has taken an awful long time to get rid of those laws um, in some cases, the move to reform the law has happened as a result of uh, human rights instruments, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. Uh, uh, these uh, provisions have been invoked uh, to try to persuade judges to overrule uh, the uh, criminal laws which were imported with British colonial administration. Uh, sometimes uh, the laws in question have been reformed by legislatures, by parliament, um, and um, probably more of the laws have been reformed by legislatures than by judges. But uh, in uh, different countries of the world, attempts have been made to get rid of these criminal laws because in the 19th century, uh, and more especially in the 20th century, uh, scientific study of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity established that to punish people for their sexual orientation uh, was um, not only um, unnecessary, but uh, cruel and, uh, and primitive uh, and uh, ought to be uh, got rid of. Uh, in many countries of the Commonwealth of Nations, there has been uh, a continuing battle to try to get rid of the, uh, the criminal laws. Uh, in the Caribbean and in parts of Africa in particular, those laws are still in place. However, uh, in India, uh, the course of judicial um, intervention 
um, was finally successful uh, in the decision of the Supreme Court of India in Johar against Union of India, which was a decision of 2018 uh, by a constitution bench of the Supreme Court of India. But let me go back to what happened in my own country, Australia, just to lay the ground of, of um, how one uh, took a lot of time and effort to get rid of these provisions because often they were supported by religious people and in particular um, Christian um, religious uh, proponents uh, in Australia and uh, that made it difficult to get rid of the criminal law uh, similar to section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. The first country uh, that got rid of uh, the criminal laws against uh, gays was in fact England, England and Wales. It's fitting that they were the first because they were the ones who gave this unpleasant legacy to so many countries. Uh, but in 1967, uh, an amendment to the criminal laws in England followed a Royal Commission of Inquiry uh, which had uh, concluded on the basis of scientific data that uh, this was an area of the law that involved an overreach of the intrusion of the state into the privacy uh, of individuals and could not be justified. Uh, that uh, move uh, in turn arose out of some very important scientific research which had been conducted in the United States of America in a most unlikely place uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, in uh, the Midwest of the United States, where uh, an expert on, um, on bees, uh, gall wasps, uh, by name Alfred Kinsey, Dr. Kinsey, uh, had turned his attention from studying bees and wall wasps to study human beings. And he turned his attention specifically to human sexuality. It seems a curious thing that that subject had not been very much studied uh, in the English speaking world. There had been people who were studying it in Germany in the 19th century, but uh, Dr. Kinsey, uh, and uh, one of his colleagues, Evelyn Hooker, uh, were two American scientists who started to study this issue of human sexuality. And when they did, they found that um, uh, in virtually every country uh, that they studied, um, but specifically in the United States of America, their own country, um, about 10% of the population uh, had experiences at some time in their lives uh, of uh, sexual and emotional sexual contact with uh, a person of the same sex. Uh, this was um, uh, something which shocked and horrified uh, some of the religious people and said, well, that just goes to show how we've got to work harder to stamp this out. But um, stamping it out has proved uh, impossible uh, because um, according to the research of Dr. Alfred Kinsey, this percentage, you can dispute as to what the percentage is, but a fairly stable percentage of people uh, have sexual, physical, and emotional um, uh, relations with people of the same sex as they are. Uh, and uh, the consequence of that was people began to ask, well, if this is so, what are we doing trying to stamp it out uh, by criminal law? Is this not an overreach of the criminal law intruding into an area where uh, there are no complaining uh, victims uh, and uh, it isn't required to deal with problems of um, uh, offences against 
underaged people or against unconsensual sexual activity, we're talking about whether there should be a criminal law against people uh, who are acting consensually, who are adults, and who are acting in private. What business is it of the criminal law to intrude into such activity? And in particular, once you begin to recognise that the numbers of people who are involved uh, are quite significant, and uh, in terms of the number, uh, police and other authorities should be deployed on much more urgent and important things than chasing around after adults who are consenting and minding their own business and asking that the state does likewise. And so uh, in England, uh, in 1965, a Royal Commission investigated. Uh, that uh, was uh, the Wolfenden uh, Royal Commission. Uh, and uh, it recommended that the criminal laws should be repealed uh, and that there should be no such criminal laws against consenting adults. Uh, that uh, took a time to gather support in the House of Commons in England, but eventually in 1967, uh, the uh, British Parliament uh, enacted, first of all, for uh, England and Wales in 1967, subsequently for Scotland and subsequently uh, uh, much more belatedly in Northern Ireland to get rid of these criminal laws in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and also in the Irish Republic, um, the um, process was much more slow. And eventually, uh, gay people in Ireland, both North and South, had to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights for support in getting rid of the criminal law. Once the law had been repealed in England, uh, people started to ask in other countries, well, should we get rid of these laws? The first to go was Canada. Canada has a national um, criminal code. Uh, and uh, like India, it had a provision similar to Section 377. Uh, and the Canadians, even before they got their um, charter of rights, moved to get rid of the criminal laws against gays. Uh, there was then a big struggle in New Zealand, and it took quite a time to get rid of the criminal law uh, against LGBT people in New Zealand, but eventually that was accomplished too. In Australia, things were even more slow uh, and in Australia, unlike India and Canada, uh, though we are a federation, criminal law is left to the states. And therefore, it, it, the provisions of the criminal law uh, vary from state to state, but every one of them, whether they had a criminal code or criminal statutes or the common law, had provisions against uh, homosexual conduct. Uh, the first state to fall was South Australia. South Australia is the only state of Australia that didn't have convicts. Uh, and uh, they had a lot of German uh, migrants, so they think rather rationally, unlike some of the uh, states that have lots of English uh, convicts and, uh, and, and people, migrants. Uh, but in any case, in 1974, uh, South Australia followed uh, the English uh, reform and repealed the criminal law through Parliament. And other states of Australia eventually did likewise, not through the judicial process, but through legislative provisions similar to the English reforms. Uh, the last state to, to change was Tasmania, the island off the coast in the south of Australia, and that uh, eventually uh, made its decision in 1968, uh, no, rather 1998. Uh, and so by 1998, uh, all of the jurisdictions in Australia had got rid of the criminal uh, law against uh, gay uh, sex. 
but uh, in most of the countries of the Commonwealth of Nations, the law lingered on, and the battle has been joined essentially since 1967, when the British got rid of, began to get rid of the laws uh, to try to um, uh, move in the same direction in different countries of the Commonwealth. Uh, the uh, British administrators had three criminal codes to um, draw on when they were setting up their colonies, uh, uh, but uh, the, um, the criminal law of India was expressed in the Indian Penal Code, and it was copied uh, in what is now Pakistan, what is now Bangladesh, and uh, what was Ceylon, now um, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, copied in Malaya, copied in Singapore, and copied in most parts of Africa, in the Caribbean, and in the British territories in South America and uh, elsewhere around the world. Um, and uh, in the 1990s, uh, the uh, a scourge of HIV hit the world, and in order to deal with that scourge, um, attempts were made uh, in many countries to combine the efforts to deal with HIV, AIDS, uh, and the reform of the criminal law. Uh, they were interrelated because if you criminalize people, it makes it very difficult to get into their brains with the information about HIV. Uh, they are stigmatized, they are put out of contact with messages about the need to protect themselves in their sexual activities, uh, and therefore the United Nations came to be involved and started to try to get countries to get rid of these peculiarly British uh, legacies uh, from the days of the British Empire. Uh, and in India, in the 1990s, along with a, a distinguished uh, senior uh, advocate uh, in India, Anand Grover, uh, and his wife uh, Indira Jai Singh, uh, and the HIV AIDS Collective, which was originally set up in Mumbai, um, I joined with a judge from South Africa, Edwin Cameron, in um, what we called a caravan. We were in this caravan going to different parts uh, of India, speaking to judges, explaining the importance of this issue for HIV, and seeking to persuade um, the uh, legal profession to support the repeal or the removal of the laws against um, homosexual conduct. Um, and uh, it was during those visits that I came to know quite a lot of Indian judges and some Indian uh, politicians and a lot of Indian lawyers, and that was a great blessing in my life to get to know so many lawyers in India. But moving uh, the uh, reform process in India as you would understand, is often very, very slow. S-L-O-W, very slow, even slower than in Australia. Uh, but eventually, a, a very important case was brought before the Delhi High Court. And uh, it came before a two-judge bench. The name of the case was NAS Foundation against Delhi, and it was an appeal to the uh, High Court of Delhi to uh, conclude, to find and order that Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code was contrary to the terms of the Indian Constitution. Uh, by that stage, uh, 2009, uh, a lot of people in India had given up on the legislative process. They didn't think that was going to happen anytime soon. 
and therefore they turned their attention to the courts. And uh, the Delhi High Court was constituted by two very fine judges, uh, A.P. Shah, who was at that stage the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court, and jo Justice Muralada, uh, one of the judges of the Delhi High Court. And they concluded that Section 377 was not compatible with the terms of the Indian Constitution, and in particular with the provisions of Articles uh, 14, 15 and 21 of the Constitution, dealing respectively with such issues as um, uh, privacy uh, and individual human dignity, uh, protection against discrimination, and protection of life and personal liberty. And therefore, uh, the decision of justice uh, given by Justice A.P. Shah uh, was um, uh, in effect a decision for the whole of India because it dealt with the constitutional validity of Section 377. Uh, I was in Geneva uh, in December uh, 2013 working on a report for the United Nations on North Korea uh, when uh, the decision came in in a news flash that the Supreme Court of India had reversed the Delhi High Court and that was in a case uh, called Koshal uh, against uh, uh, NAS Foundation uh, and Koshal's decision was in reported in 2014, uh, and uh, a two-judge bench of the Supreme Court reversed uh, the Delhi High Court uh, and said, in effect, if this is to be changed, it should be changed by Parliament, not by the courts, and in any case, it's only dealing with a minuscule number of people in the population uh, and uh, it uh, is doubtful that it needs to be changed. And in any case, no one's really pestering the gays with Section um, 377, so uh, it's not an important or priority issue. Uh, the net result of all this was uh, that there was a tremendous shock. What had been decided by the uh, Delhi High Court uh, which in a sense had liberated the LGBTIQ population of India was suddenly reversed and they were back at being criminals again. And uh, that uh, was very shocking for them and for many people in India. There was then an application to the Supreme Court of India for what is called a curative petition, which is a provision by which uh, the Indian Supreme Court can be asked to correct a decision uh, of an earlier bench of the Supreme Court uh, which has overlooked something or made a mistake uh, in its determination. And that was the argument that was advanced to the Supreme Court. Other applications were made to the Supreme Court uh, and eventually, uh, not on the curative petition, which is a very difficult relief to secure, but uh, in a new process, uh, a, a second visit to the Supreme Court of India arose uh, in the case of Johar against the Union of India, a decision of 2018. So this is four years after the decision in Koshal. And uh, in that case, a um, five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court of India on the 6th of September 2018 reversed the decision uh, that had been uh, delivered in uh, the case of Koshal and in Johar the Supreme Court of India uh, concluded that section 377 of the Indian Penal Code uh, uh, was uh, constitutionally infirm. It was incompatible with Article 21 of the Constitution, 
dealing with uh, life and personal liberty. It was incompatible with Article 15, uh, providing protection against discrimination. Uh, and it was incompatible with Articles 14 and 19 that provide protection for privacy uh, and human dignity. Uh, and uh, that decision, therefore, uh, got rid of Section 377. Uh, and uh, that was um, a, a decision that was welcomed by LGBTIQ people worldwide because it was getting rid of uh, something which had been imposed on India by um, uh, the uh, British uh, regime. Uh, the government of India took an unusual course uh, in uh, the case of Johar. It said it uh, would not intervene to um, oppose the uh, reconsideration of Koshal. Uh, it would leave the decision in the court to the wisdom of the Supreme Court of India. And so it was adopting a neutral stance. But there were a number of interveners who uh, intervened in the proceedings to oppose the setting aside of the decision in Koshal. Uh, and they uh, represented um, um, interests uh, in India uh, they uh, supported the decision in Koshal. They said it was essential to protect dignity and public morality. Uh, it was essential to stop the spread of HIV AIDS. Uh, it was essential not to undermine marriage and family life in India. Uh, and uh, it was essential not to undermine uh, freedom of conscience and religion. Uh, insofar as many of those who opposed reform were religious. Uh, but the uh, decision of the Supreme Court of India in Johar in 2018, uh, the five uh, judge bench uh, was unanimous. It, the bench comprised Chief Justice Deepak Misra writing with Justice Khan Wilka uh, Justice Nariman, Justice Chandra Chud, and Justice Malhotra. Those judges constituted the Supreme Court of India, uh, and in a most thorough examination of the issues, um, they uh, unanimously uh, concluded that so far as Justice Nariman, Justice Chandra Chud, and Justice Malhotra were concerned, in separate reasons, um, they uh, supported the Chief Justice's uh, decision. And so uh, the court was unanimous, and that uh, is the, the expression of the law in India. Uh, the court in uh, the case of Johar concluded that uh, it was not relevant that uh, the LGBT community was minuscule. Uh, the Chief Justice said, even if a single individual is afflicted by uh, the, uh, 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 the a provision of the law that is incompatible with the Constitution uh, and they apply to the court, the court will step in and make orders. Uh, the uh, court also said that uh, the fact that Section 377 was not being misused was beside the point because uh, just the fact that there was a provision making uh, activity of Indian citizens uh, and others in India uh, unlawful and criminal uh, was likely to impugn their uh, self-esteem, their self-respect, uh, their dignity as human beings, and that was something that a court would step in to correct. Uh, and it was also, they said, not relevant that it could be corrected by the legislature. Of course it could be corrected by the legisl legislature, but the fact was that the legislature had not used its power to do so. 
And that meant that where a person has applied to the courts, the court must perform its function. Uh, the legislature has its function to perform, the courts have their function to the perform, and the fact that it could have been cured by the legislature was not a reason why the courts should fail to do their uh, uh, responsibilities under the Constitution. And so uh, that was a very important decision of the Supreme Court of India, uh, and uh, it brought uh, a great deal of relief from people worldwide who were concerned about uh, trying to get rid of the criminal laws which still remain in place in other countries. In Malaya, for example, now Malaysia, uh, there is a provision, Section 377A, same in Singapore. They are direct copies of the, um, of the Indian Penal Code. Uh, and as I've told you, in Pakistan, in uh, Bangladesh, and in Sri Lanka, uh, there are direct copies. There are other parts uh, of the Caribbean, of Africa, of Latin America, that have similar provisions, uh, and uh, those provisions uh, are very slow uh, to change, but increasingly, um, uh, LGBT activists in uh, the Caribbean, in Africa, and uh, in Latin America are applying to the courts, and they're pointing to the decision of the Indian uh, Supreme Court uh, as uh, a strong precedent, because many of them have provisions in their constitutions which are uh, somewhat similar to Article uh, Articles 14, uh, 15, 21, and 19 of the Indian Constitution. And so uh, applications are being made. Um, in some jurisdictions, Belize, for example, in uh, Latin America, uh, the Seychelles Islands uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, in Botswana, uh, in Southern Africa, uh, Courts have stepped in and along similar lines to the Supreme Court of India have struck down the provisions uh, in the penal codes uh, as uh, incompatible with constitutional norms. Uh, in some jurisdictions, however, the courts uh, have uh, heard these uh, applications and as in Koshal, they have said this has to be done by parliament even though the application is made to the courts to discharge their functions. This is what has happened in Singapore, uh, in Malaysia in respect of transgender rights, uh, and uh, in Kenya, uh, though there is an appeal in Kenya from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court of Kenya that uh, is still to be determined. So uh, this is the situation that we now find ourselves in, that many of uh, the countries uh, of the Commonwealth are copying uh, the Indian uh, provision. In Singapore recently, uh, a further application was made to get change because their section is exactly the same as section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, but the uh, judges of Singapore uh, in the Singapore Court of Appeal uh, did not give relief. And uh, therefore, although Singapore is a very modern um, uh, society, uh, it still has the criminalization of uh, people for their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and uh, they have not as yet copied the uh, Indian Supreme Court decision, though another application is going to the highest court of Singapore to try to get them uh, to do just that. Now, um, it's appropriate for me to say that all of these issues are for me not purely theoretical, uh, academic uh, and intellectual. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, around about the age of 11, 
I discovered that I was gay. Uh, they've always been gay judges. They've always been gay lawyers. There's something about the work of lawyers. Lawyers have to pretend uh, that, and speak about the interests of other people. And therefore, they've got to get their minds around what other people are saying to a court. And it's therefore not difficult for lawyers to pretend that they're straight, even if they are gay. And plenty of lawyers uh, are in that boat. Uh, and I was in that boat for a very long time. When I came to India in 1960, no, 1970 um, and 1974, I came in a combi van and I went all around India with my partner, Johan, and uh, uh, and, and I saw uh, what a wonderful uh, society uh, you have in India. And therefore, to watch and see uh, the reform process and to read the decision uh, of the judges of the Supreme Court of, of India, Chief Justice uh, Deepak uh, Misra and the other justices of the Supreme Court of India, and to read of their uh, insistence that the constitution of India is a living document, that it is a document which is progressive and pragmatic, that it is there to combat uh, inequality and injustice to people, that it is there to fulfill the task of transforming society to make sure that it is an inclusive society, that it is to be construed in accordance with changing times and changing knowledge, particularly changing scientific knowledge, that constitutional morality in a land like India is the morality of a pluralistic and inclusive society, uh, and that uh, science can play a part in the understanding of the Constitution uh, and that people should not be discriminated against for a feature of their nature uh, that they do not choose and cannot change. That's like discriminating against people because they have a different skin colour or because they're women or because uh, of some other feature of their nature and sexuality and gender identity uh, are similar um, features of human uh, variation. And that's why uh, the decision of the Supreme Court of India, above all the other decisions, is to be welcomed because it heralds the principle of a progressive and pragmatic interpretation of constitutional norms uh, for uh, countries uh, in uh, Africa, in uh, the Caribbean, in Latin America, uh, and elsewhere in Asia. Uh, the um United States of America uh, secured its change in this area through the Supreme Court of the United States uh, in a case called Lawrence against Texas in 2003. Uh, uh, but uh, many countries still cling on to these old uh, relics of colonial law. But you can be proud in India that uh, the uh, Supreme Court of India correcting the unfortunate decision in uh, Koshal against NAS Foundation uh, has, in the case of Johar against the Union of India in 2018, uh, upheld uh, the rights to equality of LGBTIQ people uh, in India under the Constitution of India. So that is what I uh, came uh, to talk about. I was asked to talk for 40 minutes and I have been virtually exact again. And uh, we will now have, uh, subject to Dr. Mittal, uh, some Q&A. Uh, and uh, I look forward to answering uh, any questions that you have. Right. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Kirby. It's wonderful to you know learn from your different insights about uh, how the entire discourse has changed, undergone a transition, uh, even from Australia to you know the United States to Malaysia, some of the other common law countries, Singapore, and how definitely you know, especially in the in these common law countries, and especially when I talk about from the Indian standpoint. So in the neighboring countries, there's been, as you've rightly said, there's so much of uh, the influence that the neighboring countries have, you know, borrowed that kind of legislation from us. And we were part of the same colonial history in that sense, which which is uh, a natural thing. That That's a reason uh, most of the uh, legislations have been um, common in that sense. But yes, we have taken a, you know, a, a big leap forward in terms of, uh, uh, as I would say, and most of the legal scholars and judges would agree and say, in terms of uh, giving that kind of an equality in terms of gender uh, you know, rights to the LGBT community by virtue of uh, reading down of Section 377 in uh, the Johar case. But at the same time, I would draw your attention to one of the very interesting uh, you know, cases, which, which is these days uh, uh, sub in the High Court of Delhi about uh, recognition of the same-sex marriage. So that, that is a case which is being heard by the Delhi High Court uh, since past some time. And uh, the next date of hearing, as I can probably see, is, is January 8 of 2021. And the Delhi High Court has issued notices to to the uh, to the central government also seeking response on this issue that can the same sex marriage be registered be allowed under special marriage act in india or under foreign marriage act uh, they, there's it's actually a case involving uh, uh, you know petitioners who are of the age group two women of 47 and 36 years of age and they have been challenging the, the special marriage act and also another provisions that uh, with regard to number of factors in denial of number of rights. For example, with regard to uh, owning a house together, opening a bank account as a, you know, as a couple uh, by virtue of uh, having a status of uh, marriage, then family insurance, you know, which opposite sex couples uh, do have access to. There's several other kinds of rights as part of the uh, you know, daily routine and lifestyle. So now they have challenged this issue in the Delhi High Court, its subject is we will have to wait and you know watch that what is the outcome which will come out of Delhi High Court probably sometime in 2021 because that's how the next date of hearing is being lined up. And as we've already seen two contesting views and uh, interesting issues in that sense in uh, Navtej, uh, Johor and before that in Delhi High Court itself in Kaushal and Nas Foundation. So we can only hope that if the same Delhi High Court which is again put in a spot right in an issue of a similar kind or the similar kind of a subject matter however the the high court which gave you know these kind of two judgments and one of them then found its uh, place in the supreme court in terms of being recognized a firm uh, for for the uh, uh, for preserving and protecting the rights of lgbt community so we can hope that you know something really good will come out of it and i think it was actually very much expected because once the nafte johar judgment came it was about the recognition of uh, uh, you know, same sex. It was about the leading down of 377. But definitely, this is one of the integral, uh, integral issues that whether could the same couple right, get married and recognize that sort of a marriage under the Indian laws or even under you know, foreign laws and so on and so forth. So I think that's an interesting issue, which is lined up for all of us to you know, look forward to. Now, uh, now Mr. Kirby, I have a few questions here from our students and I'm going to unmute them and they can then directly interact with you. So I would request uh, and ask Mr. One of our students here, Shubham to ask question as he's already posted and what he wanted to interact also. So Shubham, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask the question yourself. Uh, okay. Yeah. Shubham, you can go ahead. Uh, good evening, Your Lordship. Am I audible? Shubham, a little louder. Your Lordship, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. 
And I'm not a lordship in Australia. Uh, the, the judges are called your honour, and I'm not even a judge now. So uh, you can just call me Mr. Kirby. Yeah. Uh, so Go ahead. Your honour, my question is, how can we differentiate between the natural and unnatural sexual acts? Because this distinction is not clarified anywhere, even not in the section 377 of the IPC. And since there are some judgments of the Indian courts uh, in which little distinction were made, like in the Khandu versus Emperor, the Sindh High Court said that the procreation of human being is necessary for, for the natural intercourse. And where in the Lohana Vasantalal versus State, the Gujarat High Court held that uh, the cunninglingus and the fellatio between heterosexuals falls under the section 377 because of its pervertness of the acts. So, Your Honor, how can we decide that that particular act is a natural or unnatural on the grounds of the procreation or on the grounds of the pervertness? Yes, well, this, this is a problem that has arisen in a number of countries where um, an exclusively procreational view was taken about the purpose of sex, that the only purpose of sex, so it was said, was uh, for people to have children, uh, and that anything that did not uh, contribute to having sex was unnatural. Uh, Unfortunately, that theory of uh, sex doesn't fit at all with the research of Dr. Alfred Kinsey, who uh, has done a very deep research, and a lot of other people since him have done likewise, showing that people have sex for uh, their pleasure, for their affirmation, uh, for uh, their relationships, uh, and for a whole lot of other um, uh, features uh, than, other than procreation. It's not the only reason. It is a reason, but it's not the only reason. This was a problem in Singapore too, where the, uh, the courts had held that uh, fellatio was uh, unnatural sex and therefore ran into section 377A of their penal code. They were possibly following the Gujarat High Court, uh, but the Singapore legislature uh, dealt with that by uh, part, not by getting rid of the procreational theory, but by uh, enacting a law that said um, if heterosexual people engage in uh, fellatio uh, or cunnilingus, they are not uh, guilty of an offence against three, Section 377A. So they passed a discriminatory provision, uh, discriminatory in favour of heterosexual people, whereas the right way to deal with the matter was to get rid of the so-called unnatural uh, 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 sexual conduct. Uh, the, um, the chapter of the uh, Crimes Act in New South Wales, which was the law of the criminal um, process when I was at law school, is called unnatural offences. And uh, people want to know what is unnatural about it. If it is natural to adults acting consensually and in private, and if an awful lot of people are engaged in that activity, mind your own business and don't just try to impose your view of uh, what is natural or unnatural uh, upon other uh, citizens simply because it isn't what you want to do. And so that's uh, the debate about this issue. But following the decision in Doha, it would not be compatible with the decision in Doha to uphold the uh, view that was taken by the um, by the Gujarat uh, High Court, and I therefore think that that old authority would not be uh, regarded as authority of the law in India today. Right. So, Shubham, I, I hope you know you got the answer to your, to your question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Right. So, Mr. Kirby, we have another question coming up from uh, one of our colleagues. 
Mr. Purneshwar Mahato. Purneshwar, do you want to ask it? I'll just unmute you. Give me one second. Okay. Purneshwar, you can go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Namaskar, Mr. Kirby. Good afternoon. Um, yes. Uh, so congr uh, congratulations for the book. I just uh, heard uh, my question is it recently in a Kerala High Court, a case has been filed by a trans woman. She, she is challenging Section 6 of the National Cadet Corps. That is NCC, we call it here in India. It is National Cadet Corps Act, which allows only males and females to enroll with the corps. She is a trans woman. I repeat my question again. A trans woman has moved the Kerala High Court challenging Section 6 of the National Cadet Corps, that is NCC Act, which allows only males and females to enroll with the corps. I, re I need your opinion in this regard. Yes, thank you very much. Well, um, as you understand, I was once a justice of the High Court of Australia, and I have to be pretty careful about not intruding into the responsibility of the current justices. They've got to sort out uh, what the present law says and what uh, it holds and whether it is uh, consistent with um, the Australian Constitution. Um, I don't know of that provision about men and women. It may be that in the uh, 20th century, uh, there was an attempt to stop women practicing law. This sounds very, very peculiar today because in most law schools, and I think in India, uh, women are a very large cohort of those who are coming into the law. But uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the courts in Australia held that where the Legal Pr Practitioners Act said any person who has a university degree in law may be admitted as a lawyer, that person did not include a female person. And in order to overcome that patriarchal view, provisions were enacted that said uh, a, um, a, a man or a woman may practice law, words to that effect. And it may be, this is the provision that is thought to um, intrude into the capacity of a transgender person to be admitted because they don't fit into man or woman. But I'm not sure that that would be what would be held in Australia. There have been cases concerning the uh, legislation on births, deaths and marriages as to how that applies to trans uh, people in Australia and the courts have generally adopted a very um, uh, broad-minded and uh, equal uh, approach to the rights of trans people. So I think we'll just watch that space and see what comes out of it. I don't know the legislation uh, in question but I wouldn't be too worried that that is going to be an impediment uh, and of course, in India, the Supreme Court of India has made decisions which are favourable to the rights of trans people. And that was one of the arguments in Johar that uh, it was hard to reconcile what was held by the Supreme Court of India in the trans case uh, with what was held by the uh, two judge bench in the Koshal case. Uh, and uh, Generally speaking, the Indian courts have been uh, really in advance of other countries, including my own, in relation to the rights of trans, the rights of, uh, of sexual identity. Right. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. That, that's actually a uh, you know, good takeaway on that particular question because uh, no doubt, you know, that there have been uh, Nafte Johar case and the judgment so far, but but still there are a number of questions which you will probably agree, they are hovering up there, right? which, which needs a more detailing 
And there are issues, as you probably uh, would agree, that it's not just about one judgment or the other. It's a uh, lot more in terms of uh, uh, giving those kinds of rights in the actual environment. And so much of is necessary by virtue of uh, sensitizing society and so and so forth. Right? There are different departments in the government. There are different kind of institutions, public institutions. So it's just that when it comes to a specific technicality, the judgments could prevail. But apart from that, in number of ways, the discrimination may probably continue till it you know reaches in its actual uh, uh, mandate. To, to all kinds of people who are in the seat of public offices and make a difference in terms of uh, giving away the uh, equal treatment and the rights to all the people alike. Yes, well, I, I certainly agree that you don't change everything overnight simply by a decision of a court. Uh, getting the change in people's attitudes and in the community often takes uh, a lot of time, but the courts can play a role as intellectual and uh, spiritual leaders uh, in terms of equality principles. Uh, and the experience in Australia and in the United States uh, is that once you go forward with a provision relating to uh, getting rid of the criminal penalties, and once you uh, make provision for uh, relationship recognition in civil partnerships or in marriage, um, it's very hard to go backwards. Uh, and, uh, and young people are often well in advance of their parents and grandparents in their attitudes on these things because they get to know somebody who is gay. That was one of the main reasons why I became open about my sexuality, because I thought, if, if I'm a justice of the highest court in the land, but I'm a timid, quiet, shy, frightened little person, how can I expect other people in society to uh, be um, proud and able to get on with their lives and, um, and not uh, suffer internalized discrimination? And it was my partner, Johan, uh, who insisted that we uh, be open about um, our sexuality. And I think that has been a good thing in Australia. And I hope that there will be LGBTIQ judges in India who will equally be open and similarly in, in politics uh, and in academia and people standing up and saying, uh, this is me, get used to it. I'm not changing and uh, it's, uh, the way the world is. Right. True. I really appreciate the point of view and uh, the kind, the way you took it by virtue of uh, 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 making a statement, you know, from the high office that you were occupying uh, as the nation's highest court. So that would certainly, you know, uh, make that kind of a statement for people to have a sense of confidence that, you know, when, when a constitutional judge can, uh, can, can take pride in it so there's nothing wrong right and and then they can uh, sort of also try to find a place in the society at uh, at equal level so that's really commendable so we have uh, mr kirby a couple of other questions coming from another student miss anshika so i'm going to unmute you and you can then ask question yeah anshika go ahead please hello good afternoon sir good afternoon Are you audible? thank you Yes, sir. So my question is, that despite the dramatic progress of the transgender movement in the last decade, as we can see, which results in the greater public awareness and significant legal victories also. Anshika, so slow. Anshika can, I, can I interrupt? I'm sorry. Just a little slow. Is that all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Should I repeat it? Yeah, please do. Please do. Okay. Yeah. So my question is, you know, despite the dramatic progress of the transgender movement you know, in the last decade, you can see everywhere around the world, you know, which result in the greater uh, public awareness also and significant legal victories as well. Still, the transgender people continue to face you know, blatant uh, discrimination in, in various aspects. So can we say, you know, that religion still has, you know, a larger impact on this uh, religious view? 
still has a larger impact on this issue or if it's that's the case so can you say which one should be prevail here the constitutional morality or the social morality well uh, as i have been saying i think uh, the law has a role and that's why test cases and lawyers bringing test cases and the brave lawyers who brought uh, the case of nas foundation uh, and um, delhi high uh, and, uh, and delhi uh, and uh, who fought the case of koshal and who then brought uh, the case uh, of johar i mean uh, you don't change things straight away uh, and um uh, and the first thing you had to do was to get rid of the criminal law because that was like a big barrier uh and uh, it getting rid of that law either through the legislature or through the courts is a very important uh, step uh, and uh then uh, there is the issue of relationship recognition i don't want to get involved in the matter that is before the court in uh, new delhi um in australia uh, there was a lot of opposition in the conservative political party to uh, the uh, right of gay people to get married so ultimately they uh, insisted that there had to be a um a plebiscit and the plebiscit was conducted and about uh, nearly uh, 70% voted for uh, marriage because uh, they began to see on the television people who wanted to be married uh, who were being stopped simply because they were lgbt uh, and uh, that uh, uh, is is something which was unfair and most people could see it wasn't very threatening uh, to see me and my partner my partner's the same age as i am and we are two old fogies uh, and we uh, got married after the law was changed in australia on the 50th anniversary of the day that we met so that was 50 years later and uh, there's a lot of evidence that um Uh, marriage is good for your health it's good for your mental health it's good for society it's good for people being responsible having buying their home together uh, and uh, being good citizens uh, so um, that is now uh, uh, an issue that has passed in australia because uh, it was um accommodated by the plebiscite but in america uh, it was decided by the supreme court of the united states in the case of obergefell uh, and uh, in other countries of the world it, it's been decided by the judges and so it will be interesting to me to see what happens uh, in the delhi high court and we had very good lawyers in india i mentioned anand grover uh, i would also mention vivek divan who was the son of a very famous uh, advocate uh, and his uh, brother took part uh, uh, who was not gay he took part in some of the challenges and some of the top lawyers um, uh, uh, brought proceedings uh, and um, um uh, fali nariman was one of those uh, soli sarabji was a great supporter so you've got to get the leading lawyers uh, to see this is a simple matter of equality human dignity and justice and once you start seeing that then a lot of the prejudice uh, will fade away right thank you so much that that's really interesting to note and i'm i'm happy to tell you mr kavi that while uh, you know your lecture was being delivered and uh, since i made it live stream on facebook so i received a message from mr alan grover right in uh, you know just 5 minutes back that uh, you know one uh, that uh, mentioning that he would be happy to do a series of lectures uh, for the virtual law school on similar issues in december and january excellent i'm very pleased and uh, getting these leading lawyers uh uh many of whom are not gay but they see this is a matter of equality 
uh, for all citizens. You know, in America, they used to have a law that you couldn't marry if you were a different race. Mm -hmm. And that was struck down uh, in 1967 in the case of Loving versus Virginia. So that's only um, uh, uh, 70 years ago that they had such a law. Uh, there, there's a lot of prejudice, uh, and uh, unfortunately, some of it is uh, engendered by religious people. Uh, not all religious people, but some are prejudiced. And, uh, on matters of sexuality, there's a need to get good science, because that is what uh, Charles Darwin taught us and what Alfred Kinsey taught us. Right. So uh, we have another, probably the last question coming up uh, you know, from one of the students, Mr. Kundan Kumar. So Mr. Kundan, I'm going to unmute you and I'll be happy you can ask your question directly. That would be good. Hello? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, good. Uh, thank you, sir. Good morning to all of you. Please is this, this <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. My name, um, is this also a kind of societal problem because in many countries equal treatment is not accepted easily and in many other it doesn't happen so smoothly uh, we can see an example where india indian women uh, got uh, voting voting right from the beginning of our independence uh, that is 1947 but in uh, america they uh, got a uh, very later in 1920 uh, here in India, court has also given the rights, but society has not, not accepting it. They face societal backlash and not getting rental rooms in cities, bigger cities, and they face many problems despite uh, getting the decision by Supreme Court. Uh, is this, uh, I am asking, is there a kind or society play a role uh, deciding these factors? Yes, this is where civil society is so important because civil society groups can speak up for uh, rights to equality and can speak up where the law may be uh, in a good position, but uh, because of prejudice in society, uh, people don't ensure, enjoy their full rights. Uh, and that has often been the case with women's rights. Women have often not enjoyed full equality and uh, you are correct in saying that uh, in Australia, right up into the 20th century, women originally didn't have uh, uh, everywhere the right to vote. The first country to have the right to vote for women was New Zealand. Uh, they're a very feisty little country, New Zealand, and they tend to do things in front before uh, other countries. But uh, uh, but you've got to get society behind you. And that's where the work done by uh, Mandeep Daliwal, uh, who was part of the caravan that went around uh, India on HIV AIDS, uh, being finding equality for people living with HIV. That's been an important uh, feature of decisions of the courts in India, upholding rights to equality and upholding rights to equality in the area of caste and in the area of religion this can sometimes be important uh, in India as in Australia and other countries. So we've got a lot of work before us, uh, but the LGBTIQ minority were uh, small in number and often truly hated. Uh, and it's only by uh, scientific research, uh, scholars uh, explaining the truth about human variation, as Charles Darwin said. Darwin, you know, said the way our species um, evolved uh, was through the law of variation. The fact that there was little variations in our species allowed us to change and develop new capacities. And everything in nature, including sexuality, has a reason. And therefore, we've got to explain to people who are prejudiced 
and have only old-fashioned views, that you've got to get with the science uh, because science uh, will ultimately prevail in these areas. So I hope that uh, the audience that's listening today in uh, the virtual um, uh, university law school will become leaders in uh, uh, science and in consultation and in education for the wider community. Because if you've had the privilege of education, you have an obligation to share it with each other. That's an important thing. And that's why I'm on this, um, this webinar today. Why would I be on the webinar? I could be just uh, staying at home. It's now about 6.30 at night and having a nice dinner uh, and a gin and tonic with my partner. But instead of that, I'm doing this seminar in order to spread the knowledge. That's what we've all got to do. And uh, in a country like India, with independent courts that has done uh, the wonderful decision in Johar against Union of India, you can be very proud of your Supreme Court making such a decision, standing up for the right to equality for all people, including for a minority who until now have been unpopular. And I think that's a real test of a country and India came through with flying colors. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Kirby, for this very <clears throat> interesting lecture and also, you know, mentioning that how the transition has taken place. Indeed, it's one of the very intriguing issues. It's going to be, as I see, not, uh, not an issue which is going to be settled in a very short time because it, its uh, implications are far more deeper, you know, than what we can probably think only from the point of view of the judgments, as you rightly said, you know, that so much work has to be done. So we, uh, if you if you would permit, I have another question. Can we take that up? Okay, Shivika, I have unmuted you. Please go ahead. Uh, am I audible? Yes, speak up. Uh, so my question is, uh, the people at the wall places are sometimes do not want to review the warranty or same sex marriages. What would be the possible solution? Shivika, you may need to repeat, it's not very clear. Okay, I'm repeating the question. <laughs> so people at the wall places are not sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes uncomfortable to review the warranty or same sex marriages. What would be their possible solutions to make themselves comfortable and others to change their mindset? Is the question, how do you make sure people are comfortable about their sexuality? Is that what the uh, listener is asking? Exactly, exactly. Well, um, uh, I think the answer to that is uh, people who are LGBTIQ have to start by understanding the science and the research because that makes you comfortable when you realize that you are not the only person in the class who is gay that there are plenty of people uh, including in your circle and there are plenty of judges and lawyers and others uh, politicians uh, and uh, important people and street sweepers who are gay it's just a part of human nature. Once you understand that, then you begin to uh, stand up for yourself and say, well, if people have irrational views. When I was young in Australia, we had white Australia. Have you ever heard of that? White Australia. We only people come into Australia as migrants if they were white. That was in my lifetime when I was young, but we've got over it. Uh, not entirely, uh, because there's a, there's a lot of work to change people's ignorance and prejudice. Look at the United States at the moment during their election. There is a lot of ignorance and prejudice on the racial grounds, but we've got to get over these things. And we, how do you get over them? You get over them by leadership. 
and by people who are in the minorities standing up and speaking up with dignity for their human dignity and feeling comfortable in their skin. I was lucky that my partner, Johan, uh, was from the Netherlands because they are very forthright people. I don't know if you've ever met Dutch people. They're very in your face. They're not like Anglos who are very polite. And I sometimes say to my partner, well, do you think you should have been so direct? And he says, the problem with you Anglos is you're so polite, but you are so hypocritical. And uh, he was from a country where they were not polite, but they were very honest. And so that helped me to become a bit not less polite because if you stand up for equality and justice for everyone, no exceptions, then that's how we get people feeling comfortable. And you've got to carry straight people with you. No big change with LGBTIQ uh, law was ever made without support from heterosexual people. But most of us who are gay came from heterosexual parents and het have heterosexual brothers and heterosexual sisters and aunties and uncles and family. And so once people start to talk about things, attitudes begin to change and people begin to feel more comfortable. There would be people listening to this webinar who are gay but are not open about it. And my message to them is, I was like that, but eventually when it is safe, you should be open as you can be so that you can be the change you want to see in the world. Who said that? Mahatma Gandhi. Be the change you want to see in the world. Be the change you want to see in the world. And that's what LGBT people have to do. And you can't get better advice than advice from the Mahatma. Right. That's a very wonderful and uh, <laughs> important piece of advice, Mr. Kirby, that, that uh, nothing can change unless you take up the cause from yourself and stand for yourself. Right. And you cannot uh, just piggyback on, on, on other kind of uh, people to, to fight for your cause. So we have to fight our own battles. And that's a very important mm -hmm. message as you've quoted Mahatma Gandhi, you know, uh, today. So I'm, I'm sure that, you know, a lot of our friends who are from LGBTIQ community will, will take note of it and uh, will also realize the importance of uh, coming out openly and, uh, you know, uh, talking about their identity uh, without any fear and prejudice, because that's only going to fetch them also the place in the society and they will be able to secure, you know, their rights in, uh, by me, by meeting different other heterosexual people, and you know, as, as you've mentioned, so that that's so much correct. And as we have seen that in, even in this entire uh, you know case and series of cases on LGBTIQ rights from Nas Foundation to Kaushal to Nafte Johar, there have been so many lawyers who were not gay, right? But they stood by the cause and they've been fighting for the cause. So that's a greater uh, sort of support which is already existing in the society. And I do believe and agree with you that. Uh, that the entire community can try, to, uh, you know, leverage that kind of a support. So thank you for for this for this lecture today. It's uh, it's wonderful hosting you. And I was just curious. I saw in the Q and A section if there's any other question that has come up. Right. So there's just one of our students who wants to know that if you could repeat the name of that book uh, from Universal Publications, Tagore Law Lectures, for reference. Yes, here it is. I wouldn't promote this book except that it's been written by a very clever author. <laughs> so it's Michael Kirby, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, A New Province of Law for India. It's the Tagore Law Lectures 
for 2013. And it's published in New Delhi, uh, and it's not expensive, and it's a very good read. And uh, especially scholars, there should be a copy uh, in uh, every law school, and um, I recommend it. And I don't get any money out of this book, uh, but uh, it's Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, a New Province of Law for India. So everybody should buy a copy for Christmas. Right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for, for giving your time today evening once again. And as you know that uh, we are a virtual law school, so we are not offering any degree or diploma. We are only running the law classes. So we are not recognized by the Bar Council of India or the University Grants Commission or, or, Commission or any statutory body in India. So it's a private initiative which I have started along with some of the law teacher friends who have come forward and all of us, what we do is donate pro bono law teaching hours. And we have been continuing this journey for the last six months now to be and I'm happy to share with you, Mr. Kirby, that uh, just a couple of days ago, we have uh, completed six months of running the virtual law school for mm -hmm. our law students where we have so far taught over 900 law students on different areas and subjects of law. And even at this moment, we are teaching 20 law subjects, which are core law subjects, uh, as mandated also by the Bar Council of India. So we have been following in terms of teaching to the best of our ability, the standards and the subjects to be taught, which any other law school does. However, we are not recognized and we are not promoting here any kind of a degree or a diploma either ways. So we only try to bridge the gap as there are several students who cannot pay a very heavy fees of the top law schools. And by virtue of that, they lag behind because they, could not, they cannot be taught by the top law professors and uh, at the virtual law school, I'm thankful to all law professors who have been very senior professors, but they've been donating their pro bono law teaching hours for our students who are already studying for the degree purposes in different law schools. So I'm, I'm really thankful to you as well for giving your time for the second, uh, on the second occasion today, you know, out of your schedule and uh, speaking very candidly with our students and lawyers on this very important issue. Thank you. Right. So thank you, uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, continued association with you. And I'll, you know, uh, uh, keep uh, sending you some of the updates. And uh, we hope to host you once again in future, you know, whenever it will be possible for you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, my dear lawyer friends and law students, for joining us today for the global legal approaches and development talk on equality discourse and LGBT rights uh, with Mr. Uh, Michael Kirby. And we will be coming back with more GLAD talks in the coming weeks and months. So stay tuned for all updates and thank you for all your support and blessings for the virtual law school. Have a good day, everyone, and stay safe.